Welcome to 35 West. I'm Ryan Berg, director of the Americas program at CSIS and host of the 35 West podcast. With how professional the Mexican but government. Are we ready? Uh, I don't reform think. trends in Argentina. Right. And that's what happened. No role at all in the NAFTA negotiation. Welcome to 35 West. I'm Ryan Berg, director of the Americas program at CSIS and co-host of the 35 West podcast. On June 2nd, nearly 60 million people cast their votes for the next president of Mexico, making it the largest election in Mexico's history. However, the race was also marred by election violence, with more than three dozen candidates or prospective candidates murdered over the electoral season. Threats to family members of candidates, intimidation, and coercion from organized crime further compelled many prospective candidates to withdraw from the race, illustrating the corrosive impact of violence and impunity for democratic institutions. The attacks, some carried out just days before the polls opened, showcased the inadequacies of outgoing President Andrés Manuel López Obrador's security policy, whose term has been the bloodiest in Mexican history as measured by total number of homicides. With Claudia Sheinbaum's landslide victory, curbing organized crime and insecurity will likely prove one of the greatest challenges facing her presidency, especially if she looks to continue her predecessor's approach of de-emphasizing confrontation and rolling back territorial gains and focusing instead on social determinants of crime. To help us understand the evolving criminal landscape in Mexico and the reason the country experienced so much electoral violence, we are honored to be joined today by Chris Dalby, journalist and director of World of Crime, a think tank dedicated to investigating organized crime. Chris is also the author of a new book, CJNG, A Quick Guide to Mexico's Deadliest Cartel, which charts the origins and activities of the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel, one of the key players in Mexico's recent electoral violence. Chris, it's great to have you on. Welcome to the 35 West podcast. Thank you, Ryan. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. While the elections are on everyone's mind at the moment, let's begin by taking a step back. The evolution of Mexico's criminal landscape has been one of the most profound and indeed troubling developments in recent years. Your latest book charts the development of one of Mexico's foremost criminal actors. Could you begin for our podcast listeners by sketching a scene setter for our audience? What motivated you to write this book and how has the CJNG sought to expand their influence this electoral season? Well, let me begin with a, an underrated way to begin a, a story, a statistic. The Uppsala conflict data program in Sweden over the last decade has found that the CJNG either committed or was on the receiving end of over 80% of all murders linked to Mexican cartels. For a country with as wide a range of criminal actors as Mexico, that's an astonishing monopoly on violence, right? That is a group that has essentially deliberately co-opted the use of lethal violence in most of the country, away from authorities, the police, the National Guard, and the army. That was the case long before this electoral season, but this electoral season only confirmed the inability of the outgoing government by President López Obrador to make any sort of meaningful difference to that use of violence, not just from the CJNG, but to all its criminal competitors as well. So what brought me to you to write this book is that I think, at least in the Americas, and certainly you would have to think in the top few worldwide, the CJNG simply kills more people than any other criminal organization I can think of, especially when it comes to sort of traditional organized crime. Then during this electoral season, we really show that the CJNG is unique in the Mexican landscape. Plenty of criminal groups in Mexico, from large to small, ceased to influence elections by intimidating, threatening, and even killing candidates. But a lot of them want to find accommodation. The Sinaloa cartel, for a long time, indeed has threatened and killed politicians, but has sought to not necessarily unbalance the status quo in its own backyard, right? It looks for people that it can do business with, whether it be in the short term or the long term. The Jalisco cartel doesn't seem to operate like that. Of course, there are plenty of examples of the CJNG being in bed with politicians at the municipal, state, and even federal level. But even in states like Jalisco, Guanajuato, northern parts of Michoacán, where the CJNG, yes, has some criminal rivalry, but not as serious as in other parts of Mexico, it is still dropping a lot of political and police bodies. Why? That's what the book really seeks to explore, why the CJNG views violence not as a means to an end, but as a basic foundation of its form of criminal government. 
As we described briefly in the intro, Chris, violence or the threat of violence has overshadowed every stage of the electoral process with effects that are far more wide reaching than just the bloody episodes that catch the national headlines. In your opinion, what have been the primary drivers of election violence in Mexico this year? And how do these differ from state to state across the country? Of course. We have to remember that there are three major elements that, for me, define the reasons behind electoral violence and how they vary from state to state. One are the prime criminal economies in a state in question, right? If a state controls a major port or there are major drug trafficking routes going through that state, you're going to see increased criminal competition and you're going to see increased pressure on state and local officials in key areas to allow business to go through, right? To collaborate, to look the other way, or even to actively participate in that criminal economy. But drug trafficking is often seen as the begin-all and end-all of of political violence in Mexico, especially when it comes to international observers. That's not the case. A state like Guanajuato, oil theft or fuel theft is a major driver. It's a major criminal economy in the state. It's a major earner for groups like the Jalisco cartel or the Santa Rosa de Lima cartel for over a decade now. You know, you have pipelines going through the state, connecting it to Mexico City, connecting to other refineries. The López Obrador government, early on in in its term, saw fuel theft as one of the major security threats. And it was right. And did a concerted effort to reduce the number of of instances of theft. That worked for a little while, but it was essentially a game of whack-a-mole that after a year or two, the government seemed to give up on. The second one is that much of Mexico, especially at the local political level, still operates under what's called casicasco, patronage, right? Where you have embedded families or party networks or community-led networks of corruption that dominate elections. And that even goes from party to party. So when López Obrador comes to the fore with his Morena party, that is still taking a lot of people from PRI, a lot of people from PAN, building on a lot of the state and national networks of corruption. Those simply changed their name, right? They simply went from PRI-PAN to Morena. So while the party might seem new, much of the edifice of official corruption it relies on was built in decades past. So that also influences electoral violence then, because different criminal groups might react differently to different political candidates. For example, there's a wonderful new book by Anabel Hernandez about the Sinaloa cartel's links to López Obrador. And the Sinaloa cartel, having had decades in the game or its ancestors decades in the game, has been able to build these long-term political relationships, first with PRI and now, allegedly, according to Hernandez's book, extensively within the the López Obrador administration. The CJNG doesn't operate like that. It may have alliances at a local level, even at a state level, but nationally, there's been no evidence of that sort of top-level alliance that governs what more local plaza bosses are going to do. So the third thing is this. The third element is the way in which different criminal networks view political violence as a means to an end. Some view it as a means to confirm or expand the status quo. Some view every electoral cycle as a way to roll the dice and find new ways to govern, new people to intimidate, and new criminal economies to co-opt. Chris, we saw most of the violence concentrated against state and local candidates. In one case, just days before the election happened, one candidate was assassinated at point-blank range from behind. A perpetrator was allowed to get that close. Why was security for candidates at the local level so lacking? Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask the outgoing president or you ask the security ministry, they will tell you there's simply too many threats to too many candidates across the country and they don't have the resources to police them all. That is actually true. There are thousands of candidates. More if you talk about pre-candidates, there's a lot of that intimidation, a lot of that violence actually happens before even primary elections happen, right? That's how early in the game criminal networks are looking to influence things. So on one point, that is actually true. I actually do believe that probably they don't have the resources to, to protect every single candidate in every single state where criminal violence is a threat. And they say they, they act once threats become meaningful once threats become real. It's difficult to gauge to what level that is true. In large cities, more mediatized, more publicly famous candidates often did have protection details. Who was paying for that is unknown, whether it was paid for by the central government, whether it was paid for by their party or even out of their own pockets. As we know in Mexico, being a politician is a way often of increasing one's wealth in controversial ways and, of course, of having the the money and the influence to buy protection. Secondly, it's very difficult to know what local 
and even state electoral manipulations are happening, what discussions have happened between candidates and criminal groups, and what triggers a criminal group to actually act and assassinate someone, right? We saw a candidate in the town of Celaya, for example, be murdered. That is one of the most violent cities in Mexico. It's regularly among them and one of the most violent cities in the world. You would say, well, if there's one part of Mexico where candidates have been ready and have protection, it's there. Clearly, that, that wasn't sufficient. And then the latest thing is that, as I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, the use of violence, the ability to act with impunity in fatal ways, belongs to the cartels, not to the government. And every electoral cycle is a way for the cartels to hammer that home and say, we have the guns, we have the power, we have the access, not you. Right. A fresh reminder of who has the monopoly on power. Chris, you spoke about how early in the process cartels get involved in politics and in in threatening some of the candidates. Talk for a second about how threats and intimidation, both to candidates and their families, have caused individuals to simply avoid the political arena altogether who might have participated otherwise. So there's actually an obstacle before that. This varies across Mexico, but there are states in which it is very, very difficult for a fresh actor to penetrate that inner circle of politics, to even get on the ballot as a pre-candidate, or if they are on the ballot to receive any real airtime, to receive media time, to receive attention from Party Central, right? Again, going back to this paid political patronage system that wards off outsiders, right? You have to prove yourself within a party ranking, you have to prove yourself in terms of fundraising, you have to prove yourself in terms of loyalty, quote unquote, to be able to access political rankings above, let's say, the small municipality level, and even then. So that's one obstacle that bars a lot of new people from coming in. Secondly, at the smaller municipal stage, where yes, there might be, it might be easier for those candidates to come in, we know for a fact that there are hundreds of people who have fled after entering politics. Before being pre-candidates, before even declaring their candidacy, they were, they were just rumored to be looking for a nomination and they would receive a death threat or, you know, a drive-by shooting at their house, and they would flee the country. There are records of hundreds of people fleeing different parts of Mexico because of that. Then, once you enter, let's say, the final stages of a political campaign, once primaries have happened, once candidates are officially on the ballot, again, it's very difficult to know what interactions trigger a shooting or trigger a threat. There are cases of corrupt politicians who've been arrested, of corrupt police commanders who've been arrested and have actually spoken, to say that, the interaction with criminal groups is constant. Sure, it might be higher during election season, but it is a constant duty of a local elected official or security official to assuage the doubts of your local cartel plaza boss, of ensuring him of your loyalty, of giving him access to whatever he requires, whether it's 10, 15% of a municipal budget, whether it's access to state databases of agricultural producers or of local economies so they can know who to extort. It's a constant back and forth relationship. It's not just, oh, yes, we'll collaborate with you and, you know, we'll do you a favor somebody like in The Godfather. It's a constant to and fro. I want to talk for a second about the coverage of this election. We know that in Mexico, it's Mexico is one of the most dangerous countries in the world to be a journalist. A lot of focus on journalist killings under this administration. How has violence toward the press shaped the discussion and the coverage of these elections, including of issues like violence in the election? It is an intentional strategy by criminal groups to create news deserts in Mexico, to simply kill or drive out uh, local newspapers, local radio, or local correspondents from national newspapers, to simply have it be a fact that to try and report in depth on the ground in certain areas is not worth it. The result of that is that the coverage of the election, certainly at the the national and international level, has been very top-down. It's been when the central government or when governorships of key states have made a ruckus about one or more assassinations that the international press has paid attention. There is, of course, monitoring by excellent NGOs, again, nationally and internationally. ACLED has done a wonderful job at mapping every known, I insist on every known instance of uh, political violence in Mexico during this season, as they have in, in past elections. So the data is there to be interpreted. The problem is it's very difficult to access local experts, local politicians in the most violent parts of Mexico because they're not going to talk to you because they're genuinely afraid of retribution. And anyone who might have been willing to talk to you has often been driven away. 
So the absence of good local regional journalism in Mexico has been devastating to understand the local impact of this uh, electoral violence. From the U.S. perspective, Chris, the worsening security situation in Mexico has raised hackles and brought about comparisons in recent political rhetoric to violent non-state insurgencies like ISIS or the Taliban. There are, however, important differences between a criminal group, even complex and well-institutionalized players like those in Mexico, and a politically motivated insurgency. You've studied Mexico's criminal landscape for years. What would you say are the defining features of the current criminal armed conflict in Mexico? Talk a little bit about the model of territorial control that has been discussed in so much of the coverage of this election-related violence. So, first of all, I agree completely that any discussion, especially in, in the U.S. political arena, that Mexican cartels should be fought in the same way as ISIS or the Taliban are usually highly counterproductive, are usually the result of political gamesmanship or simply a lack of understanding and education. However, both in Mexico and in parts of the world like Afghanistan or Myanmar, we begin to see the formation of what at Inside Crime they call criminal hybrid states, where in most of these countries, in Afghanistan or in Myanmar, a military junta or a religious insurgency like the Taliban gains power on supposed political reasons and then finds that it is very lucrative to be in bed with criminal economies, transnational criminal economies, drug trafficking, extortion, arms trafficking, both uh, prominent in those two countries. In Mexico, we see a similar situation happening, but coming at it from the opposite angle. Obviously, it's not at a national level. Anyone who calls Mexico a, a narco state, I think that's, that's often banded about a bit too easily. But there are certainly large parts of Mexico, Jalisco, Colima, much of Sinaloa, Guanajuato, where there is criminal governance, effective, permanent criminal governance. It's not a member of the Jalisco cartel who's the governor of Guanajuato. But one could certainly say there's an influence there. And there again, it becomes very lucrative for the criminal networks to play politics. Not becoming politicians, but to control politicians, to dictate their authorities, and to gain access to precious state resources to further their criminal economies. I always use Silo and Jalisco Cartel as the, as the two main ones in Mexico. They are the two largest groups in the country, and they operate very differently. The Sinaloa Cartel came from the people of Sinaloa. I think El Chapo's reputation as a Robin Hood figure is, is far too overplayed. Similarly for, for Escobar, they were both monsters. But there was a sense of care and duty and giving back to the community to a certain extent. Of course, it was advantageous for both. El Chapo didn't want people in his community to be shopping him to the authorities and telling people where he was. So there was a certain degree of protection there. Extortion was forbidden for much of the El Chapo years in territories under Sinaloa control. Now with the Chapitos coming in, his, his sons, that has evolved a little bit. They're much more capitalist in their attitude of doing business. Extortion is allowed, but in much more top-down ways, right? They will co-opt an industry, mandate the prices, mandate the ways in which people in that industry can operate, for example, fishermen, mandate to who they can sell and set the price for the catch. The Jalisco cartel does not give a damn about that sort of hierarchy. They have a limited sense of giving back to the community and protection in certain parts of central southern Jalisco, maybe in Puerto Vallarta, again, where their people operate and live, the communities where their most important leaders' families are. But numerous studies have shown that the Jalisco cartel extorts every part of Mexico where it is in a way that unseen since the Zetas. We are talking foot on the boot of ranchers, farmers, truckers, oil workers, extorting every peso they can. There is evidence that they don't care if people go out of business because they will just take your business and sell it or give the land to someone that they know, whether it's avocados in Michoacan or the tequila industry or ranchers sending cattle to the U.S., because of, they have access to the state databases that tell them, if you're a rancher, we know how many heads of cattle you have. We know how many you're sending to the US. We know how much you're selling each of them. They can extort you, take up to half of your profits very clinically. It's a very economic calculation. And that sort of constant extortion is really a, a model of Jalisco areas. We see it happen to a lesser extent in other parts of Mexico, but it's very much a Jalisco-led criminal model. 
Chris, we often hear claims either from Morena or from the opposition that criminal groups have preferences, that they express preferences for political parties and that assassinations impact one party or several political parties more than others. In this election season, when we saw all of this violence, do you think that certain groups express preferences for specific political parties or are they more interested in who they can co-opt or coerce? And in a sense, it was an equal opportunity assassination campaign. It would be a little bit reductive to say it was an equal opportunity assassination campaign. But the data from which Morena makes that claim comes from, you know, 70 plus years of essentially one party rule, right? With a few pan governments in there. But we're talking about a, about a country where the civil service, the tax collection, the customs were built by a largely pre-administration. So there are indeed plenty of records that show Sinaloa cartel and pre being in bed together at a relatively institutionalized level, right? Garcia Luna obviously being a, an example of that. However, recent investigations, including one done by, by Insight Crime earlier this year and Annabel Hernandez's book, also show that Lopez Obrador, even before Morena was a thing, had alleged connections to high-ranking members of the Sinaloa cartel as well. It's simply a cost of doing business at some point in Mexico. And the Sinaloa cartel's relationship to politicians seem to be that. We are the cost of doing business. It is cheaper for you to deal with us, to work with us, than to deal with the consequences. At the Jalisco cartel level, I studied pretty closely four presidential elections worth of of violence. I didn't see any meaningful patterns. More Morena politicians were threatened in the last two presidential elections or general elections. But indeed, there were more Morena candidates on the ballot and there were more Morena candidates winning. We're talking about, you know, a vast majority of governorships now are Morena. There's a super majority for Claudia Shanbaum. So the next few election cycles, if Morena can maintain that sort of dominance, will be interesting because we'll start to see the same data patterns as when PRI was dominant. And we will see then if it's an equal opportunity assassination campaign. What I will say is that, again, reassert the point that Morena is not some maverick political party out of the blue. It has a lot of former PRI members. It has a lot of former PAN members. It has people who've been attached to the Mexican left and Lopez Obrador for decades. It's an instrument of state with a new name. So the networks that those people founded in their own careers didn't disappear or or become renewed once they joined Morena. Morena's relationships with cartels are operating on the backs of decades of cartel political collusion. Certainly. Morena, as a potentially new hegemonic political party in in Mexico, has been a big tent party. It's brought in people from from a number of former parties who have sought to get on board with the cresting wave as Morena has become more or less a hegemonic political party in in Mexico. Chris, I want to hear from you about this figure that we often talk about in U.S. rhetoric about how much territory is controlled by organized crime in Mexico. You hear varying numbers. Sometimes analysts will throw out the number of one third of the territory, sometimes as high as one half of the territory or higher controlled by criminal cartels. Could you break down for us what territorial control means? And do you have your own estimate of how much territory Mexican TCOs might control? To be honest, I think it's a false friend to look at it that way. I think it's it's a way of, of quantifying something that cannot and really shouldn't be quantified because you are talking about a sclerotic system, which is rotten to the core in every Mexican state. Of course, with varying degrees of violence, varying degrees of, of homicides, but corruption is present in every Mexican state. Even the states which we see as you know, being green or slightly less yellow in homicide maps or corruption maps or, or violence heat maps like Baja California Sur or Tlaxcala or Yucatan, And that's because those states are either semi-permanently or temporarily outside the action ranges of the cartels in terms of drug trafficking or weapons trafficking or migrant trafficking, right? I give you the state of Chiapas, for example. The state of Chiapas was for a long time, let's say, Sinaloa cartel territory. The Sinaloa cartel controlled much of the border with Guatemala, was able to use Guatemala as, as a rear base, stash drugs there, profit from migrants coming across, But Chiapas was a relatively peaceful state. Yes, there was always some level of of violence. It was mid-ranking in in homicide tables. And then in the last two years, when the Jalisco cartel moves into that area to contest what is fairly rich criminal territory, numbers soar up, right? Indigenous communities are affected. Tens of thousands of people are displaced. So by the measure of control, 
Chiapas was always controlled by a cartel. The Sinaloa cartel was operating there with impunity, but it wasn't violent necessarily or very violent. Now there's a dispute for that control and violence goes up. So again, I think it's a wrong way of looking at things to, to look at control. There are parts of Mexico where due to political convenience, due to geographical location, there is less cartel presence, for sure. The states of Yucatan, Baja California Sur and Tlaxcala are evidence of that. But for example, the state of Zacatecas, which was always central ground between Sinaloa and Jalisco for a long time, had relatively low levels of cartel violence, despite drug trafficking being going through it. Since the fentanyl crisis breaks out, Zacatecas is top or near the top of Mexican homicide rankings year on year on year. So territory is a very ephemeral concept, right? It's more about what zones only have one cartel operating there or are temporarily off the cartel radar. Claudia Sheinbaum, who will take office on October 1st, is going to inherit a very difficult challenge from organized crime, but also a question of how to preserve or modify some of her predecessor AMLO's controversial security policy. So in your opinion, Chris, how can we expect Sheinbaum to confront the threat of organized crime in Mexico? Should we expect much change from the current administration? So I actually think the coverage has been a little bit unfair to Sheinbaum. I think there is a credible fear that she will be similar to Lopez Obrador, that she will be under his thumb. Lopez Obrador was woefully inefficient at confronting organized crime. He seemed to essentially abandon the issue as his presidency went on. It affected his overall rankings not one bit, even though he polled consistently low when it came to security. And there is a real threat that he will force or he will pressure Scheinbaum to continue that agenda. However, when you look at Scheinbaum's record as Mexico City mayor, it's actually not that bad. Homicides are down in consistently double-digit down year on year when she was mayor. We see a drop in violent crime. And much of that has been put on the back of her security secretary, Omar Garcia Harfuch, who was almost assassinated a few years ago by the Jalisco cartel in broad daylight in one of Mexico City's most public thoroughfares. That tells you he was, you know, if they're shooting at you in that way, you might be doing something right. That's not to say that Harfuch has has a clean record, but he's consistently been a, a thorn in the side of the Jalisco cartel new generation for years. He was part of the prosecution team that brought down Menchito, the son of El Mencho, the leader of the CJNG. He consistently, from what we see of, of judicial records, thwarted the entrance of CJNG leaders into Mexico City and arrested several of their members there, which is believed to be the reason why they tried to kill him. Now, he ran for Mexico City mayor in this campaign, failed, and now is a top advisor to Scheindau. So their track record in Mexico City is actually fairly good. Now, Mexico City has never been the heart of the heartland of cartel violence. It's always been a little bit outside the dynamics of, of Mexico City, but still. A win's a win, right? And in this political landscape in Mexico, whatever win we can try and get hope in is is worthy. So I'm torn between what's going to happen with Shandam. So far in her campaign, she wasn't very inspirational about her plans. It was all what we've heard before, right? Some vague, nice-sounding keywords about socioeconomic change, about trying to lower the body count. Great, but it was it was low on specifics. Mexico City is not Mexico. What you can achieve in the, let's say, relatively controlled environment of the capital quickly goes away when you look at the very much state by state, even municipality by municipality specifics of Mexico. So I think it's going to be very difficult for her. I don't have great expectations. She hasn't shown particularly innovative thinking, but there is the little carrot of, okay, in Mexico City, her security strategy wasn't a complete flaw. So words of faint praise there. When it comes to U.S.-Mexico bilateral ties, do you think under a Sheinbaum administration, the two sides can reset security cooperation? And if so, how? I think so. On this, I am actually quite optimistic. First of all, López Obrador did great damage to the bilateral relationship. Uh, Certainly, he didn't always have a, a good interlocutor in the White House. But his consistent, almost baffling denial of basic realities like fentanyl is not produced in Mexico or fentanyl is not killing any Mexicans. You're like, well, millions of pills being seized every year at the U.S. border says different. His odd paternalistic relationship with the Guzman family, yeah, was part of his sort of denial of reality when it came to security. Scheinbaum hasn't shown that yet. And Scheinbaum has actually shown a willingness to cooperate with U.S. law enforcement. There was an excellent article a couple of days ago in the Wall Street Journal that talked about how While she was mayor of Mexico, she was getting a lot of help from the DEA. She was interfacing with a lot of American mayors, including the city of Oakland in California, looking at the way that 
gun violence had been reduced in those cities and beginning to actively apply those methodologies in Mexico City. So that at least shows a willingness to learn. It shows a willingness to cooperate. And I think her general demeanor is not as stubborn as that of Lopez Obrador. She hasn't been through the same political war as Lopez Obrador. She's a climate scientist. She's not coming at this from decades of hardcore political experience. So I do think that at least at the surface level, Joe Biden and whoever is the, is, the, is the future president of the United States will have a much more receptive friend in Claudia Scheinbaum. Chris, is there something that we did not cover? Anything else that you would like to highlight or add for the podcast? I think the impact of the fentanyl crisis. Uh, obviously, that's going to be probably topic number one when it comes to U.S. and Mexican criminal cooperation. But we have seen in the last years the supply chain for fentanyl diversify rapidly around the world, right? As attention has been on China, again, investigations by Inside Crime and others have shown precursors for fentanyl coming in from India, from Europe, from Turkey, coming into Mexico through other ways. And that, despite a small dip in, in overall overdose deaths last year, remains a red alert for America. So I think that is the way that we can measure early the level and the quality of cooperation is, okay, can new strategies be found to deal with the fentanyl crisis? And the second one is the migration crisis. Obviously, Joe Biden's actions this week have been very controversial. They're only going to worsen the ways in which tens of thousands of migrants at the U.S. border or on the Mexican side of the U.S. border are being constantly criminalized, exploited, extorted, sexually abused, and murdered. That is another topic that the U.S. or Mexico can ignore for long. Chris Stalby, journalist and director of World of Crime and author of the new book, CJNG, A Quick Guide to Mexico's Deadliest Cartel. Thanks for joining us on 35 West. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Thank you very much, Ron. It was a pleasure. For you, thank you for joining. Stay tuned for the next episode of 35 West.